Ryan, let's start with Israel and actually really with Gaza. Yes. So the United Nations Human Rights Council delivered a report uh, yesterday uh, finding that the, the plausibility of genocide is growing uh, greater and greater. Let's play a little bit of this clip from the UN. Following nearly six months of unrelenting Israeli assault on occupied Gaza, it is my solemn duty to report on the worst of what humanity is capable of and to present my finding, the anatomy of a genocide. One of my key findings is that Israel's executive and military leadership and soldiers have intentionally distorted rules of international humanitarian law distinction, proportionality, and precaution in an attempt to legitimize genocidal violence against the Palestinian people by deliberately stretching the definitions of human shield, evacuation orders, warnings, safe zones, collateral damage, and medical protection, Israel has used their protective function as humanitarian camouflage with the effect of concealing patterns of conduct from which the only inference can res reasonably be drawn is a state policy of genocidal violence against the Palestinians. In light of this, I find that there are reasonable grounds to believe that the threshold indicating the commission of the crime of genocide against Palestinians as a group in Gaza has been met. Specifically, Israel has committed three acts of genocide with the requisite intent causing seriously, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. So there's the UN Human Rights Council stating what is in increasingly hard uh, to recognize from the outside, that Israel is committing a genocide in, in Gaza. And I found it interesting the way that they, curious for your take on this, uh, the, the way that they pointed to what we've all seen, which is Israel saying, okay, everybody in the North, you evacuate to the South, uh, and then firing at people as, as mm -hmm. they're going, and then firing at people in the safe zones, and then saying, okay, yes, uh, we attacked this hospital, but it's because there were tunnels underneath the hospital, and therefore these were, quote unquote, human shields. Right. And so they were... Uh, you know, unfortunate but legitimate military targets. And the UN here saying, no, no none, of, none of that is an excuse against what you're doing. And it seems to us to be a deliberate and calculated move. Something I find interesting about all of this, I go back to a conversation we had, I think in December, with an expert on genocide, mm -hmm. who we were talking with him about the sort of post-World War II historical uh, genesis of the current definition of genocide that we have, which was a reaction to the horrors of World War I, World War II, that had just absolutely terrorized gener a couple generations of people um, in the earlier half of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, these... these questions are so it's it's we agreed to hold ourselves to a higher standard right. basically and when you know sort of listen to UN human rights council there is something to be said as you were just uh, discussing that when for instance when they fire on people in the the so-called like humanitarian corridor corridors or the escape corridors however they uh, phrase it um, they're saying they're terrorists among them. You know, that Hamas is putting civilians at danger by embedding in wartime uh, with people who are legitimately trying to evacuate. Um, and it just reminds me of the David Brooks column, I think from last week, where he said, what would you have Israel do? Not fire on people as they're escaping. You know, like- yeah, it, Good start. It, like actually, like they're actually, it's, it's not that these questions aren't complicated. It's not that militants are not embedding with civilians. Um, it's, it's just that, you know, we all agreed to what happened after World War II to these new standards. And that's, you know, it doesn't make, certainly doesn't make war easy uh, to, to fight a, a war in the, a way that meets these standards. But what would you have Israel do? Not that. Good reason to reach a peace deal. And so Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, was uh, met with Net Netanyahu yesterday, and uh, we can put up this Axios report because I think this uh, this puts it well. Uh, Blinken unloads on Bibi. You need a coherent plan or face disaster in Gaza. And, and their lead goes, Secretary of State Blinken warned Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet in a meeting on Friday, sorry, I said yesterday, mm. that Israel's security and its place in the world are in peril. And quote, you might not realize it until it's too late, a source familiar 
with the meeting told Axios. And this, this is the message that we've been getting publicly from the Biden administration to the press uh, and to, to Israel that because it, it, it almost isn't credible for the Biden administration to say that they are concerned about Palestinian welfare. And so the way that they constantly frame their concern about Israel's actions is that they say what Israel is doing is hurting Israel because everybody does agree that the United States does yeah. not want to see Israel harmed. If, by the way, it's basically the argument Donald Trump made recently. He, he, Donald Trump made, that's a very good point. Uh, he, gave an, he gave an interview to Sheldon Adelson's paper, mm -hmm. or the late Sheldon Adelson's paper, the, it's a free paper in Israel. It's the most widely read paper in, in the country. And he said exactly that, right? He said, you need to wrap this up, was practically his quote, right? He's like, this is, you don't realize how badly this is hurting you. There is some type of bubble going on in Israel right now that, that does seem to be blocking world opinion from, from getting through. It's a, it's a combination, I think, of the, the war fever, the, the trauma from October 7th, and the, the propaganda inside Israel that the entire world is against us, even though the entire world has kind of for decades has supported Israel against the Palestinians. But the entire world is against us. The thousands of years of anti-Semitism are, are, are driving the criticism of our war effort uh, rather than the actual images that we're seeing, that the entire world is seeing coming out of Gaza. Mm. The, yeah, the, the, the Trump point, I think, is... The, actually, because you're right. It's the same point that Biden's making. Like, guys, you don't have any idea how bad this is for you. Well, and so I wanted to get your take, Ryan. I think I showed you this before we started, but I was reading in the Jerusalem Post about uh, al-Shifa, and I know we're about to get to that, but they write, around 6,000 civilians were also evacuated, but unlike the November operation when there was no inspection of evacuees, these civilians were evacuated with a careful inspection to catch all of the terrorists. And the pressure that Biden is exerting on Israel, Israel is mad about. Obviously, there have been, you know, words exchanged between Netanyahu and Blinken and Biden, and Israel obviously feels like it's getting way too much pressure uh, from the U.S. to move to, like, precision operations or a ceasefire, um, anything on that sort of spectrum of wrapping it up to paraphrasing, <laughs> paraphrasing Donald Trump. Um and yeah, it's true. That's not f like the full demand for a ceasefire, and it's not going full. You know, saying uh, as the UN just did. You know, it's it's not making that designation from the U.S. I think the pressure is at least real, though. It might not be enough, but mm -hmm. I think it is at least real because it does seem like Israel is actually adapting. Yes, the pressure is real to have the United Nations, for instance, uh, special rapporteur there, saying that Israel is committing genocide. Like that, it, that is, that that rep that represents something that can't be ignored. You know, the the, the case that South uh, that South Africa brought before the International Court of Justice with a, with something like thirteen other countries backing it up, uh, where the judges found pl a plausible case that genocide is going on. All of this is creating pressure, and, we're, and we'll talk about, uh, talk in a second about how Israel is actually concerned that this might lead to a restriction um, in arms flows. But it has created this. Th this refrain from the United States that, well, look, Israel's just going to do what it's going to do. It's a sovereign country. And we actually have a clip um, that we can roll uh, from the State Department m making this point here. Let's roll Matt Miller, State Department spokesperson. Number one, when it comes to dictating, you're right. No, we do not dictate to them. We can't dictate to them. They're a sovereign country. And the United States can't dictate to any sovereign country. They're going to make their own decisions. And they have been quite clear about that. And we would expect nothing less from any sovereign country. That said, we always offer our best advice to them. Ryan, go ahead. Just on, on your point about Israel being a sovereign country in the U.S., can't tell them what to do. Back in May 19th, 2021, you have uh, Joe Biden telling Netanyahu, his quote was, hey, man, we are out of runway here. It's over. And it was over. Ronald Reagan famously did the same back in 1982, told him it was over. Why can't he say it's over this time? Does that mean he it supports the continuation of this war, even if it means going into Rafa? So we support Israel's uh, ability to defeat Hamas. We support Israel's legitimate security objectives. We support um, uh, them ensuring that October 7th can never happen again. And so we continue to support their ability to do that while offering as I, them, as I said, our best uh, advice on how to, uh, to go about that campaign. And that's what we'll continue to do. What is your assessment on those two Hamas battalions that, you, that the U.S. has said are so key to take out and that Israel has said are key to take out? 
What's the assessment on why Hamas wouldn't be able to just create new create new battalions you so, know, that, in, in the absence yeah. of a political solution? That said, your underlying question is exactly right. Ultimately, um, something that we have learned in our counterterrorism experience around the world is that you can, uh, while you can accomplish counterterrorism objectives on the battlefield, ultimately, uh, when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to winning the larger battle, um, you have to offer a political path for the Palestinian people's legitimate, uh, or in this case, you would have to offer. We believe you have to offer a, a, a political path for the Palestinian people's legitimate aspirations. So after that, I asked the what I think is the obvious follow-up question. I said, would Hamas? have any role, any version of Hamas have any role in this political solution mm -hmm. that you're saying is, is essential, that you can't win this militarily. And he said, absolutely not. Hamas is a horrific and brutal terrorist organization, which you can just draw the circle. You get right back to the beginning then. Okay, well now, then you have to eliminate all the battalions. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you've eliminated the battalions. If you don't have a political solution, they're just gonna make more battalions because you need a political solution. But you can't have a political solution that involves Hamas so then they're going to just create more battalions. And, right. and he says, we've learned from our counterterrorism experience over the last 20 years with the global war on terror that you can win on the battlefield. But if you don't get to, if, you, if you don't win politically, if you don't get to some type of peaceful resolution, those battlefield victories are quickly reversed and, and new terrorists are created. Mm. Uh, so I don't see them. I, I don't see them getting out of that doom loop there. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest problems with like this entire uh, purported plan, the day after plan. Right, we, we hear so much about the day after plan, day after plan. It just there's you can put it out, like you can type it out, but it's not feasible. Whatever they're saying, like to, first of all, it took them long enough to even put anything out about what if you had this like successful eradication of Hamas military operation, what comes the day after. Um, nothing feasible has pre been presented. And it's not because it's like an easy situation. It's obviously an incredibly difficult and complicated situation, but nothing that's been advanced in support of this vast sweeping military operation yeah. is, is feasible. And the U.S. has floated the Palestinian Authority as as the kind of political entity that could get you to a some toward a, toward a resolution. But you've, ha you've seen Israel respond to that saying, well, there was a, a PA a police officer recently that killed an Israeli uh, so a soldier and, and injured several others. And so you can't, you can't have that institution. But if you take that logic a step further and you ha actually have universal values around the question, then you ask yourself, wait a minute. So you're saying that committing atrocities and, and let's say committing acts of genocide uh, makes you no longer legitimate as a governing force. Mm. Like, but that only goes one direction. That's although they don't agree yeah. with the UN categorization, they dispute the UN. No, but they certainly. I, I, I would imagine they'd have to acknowledge at least some atrocities. Like, let's say the four unarmed teens that they blasted with the drone the other mm -hmm. day. Like, just just that. You'd say, well, you how could you have how could you have the people operating that drone be a legitimate you know, political force going forward. It's it's a total, yeah, I mean, it's, the, we have done this for decades, obviously, like say one thing, and then I was reading Ollie North's memoir, actually, recently, mm. and one of the things he <laughs> says is, you know, it was, it, one of the things he, he found frustrating, it, he's like, you know, the, the British, the Israelis, they were trading weapons, too. The problem when we do it is that we were, like, sanctimoniously saying, Nobody should do this. Like we would never do this. Um, but of course, this is yeah. This is the Iran Iran Contra Iran guy. Contra, right. Yeah. Uh, so meanwhile, speaking of global pressure, uh, for three days now we've seen massive protests in in Jordan against the war. We can roll some of the the footage coming out of there. Uh, every time you have you know, some type of crisis in the region, you'll have you know dozens or maybe hundreds of people go down to the Israeli embassy. Uh, the last three days or so, you've seen thousands upon thousands of Jordanians who most Jordanians actually are, Pal are of Palestinian descent. Uh, it's like a majority of the Jordanian population. And so th this, this is a especially dicey political situation for U.S. ally Jordan. Uh, Jordan is a, a dictatorship that, that, recognizes, uh, that recognized Israel without getting a solution to the Palestinian question. 
that has always been a source of consternation among you know Palestinians and also just regular Jordanians as well. Uh, this is the you know so-called Arab street that people like Thomas Friedman have been warning about you know for decades. Mm. But it, the, the Arab street is a real thing, and there's only so long that these populations are going to allow their governments to collaborate with Israel in this annihilation mm -hmm. of their of their family members across and the border. It gets to the feasibility of any so-called day after plan as well. Right. I mean, again, it's not because it, this isn't difficult and complicated. Um, it's, it's not because there aren't extremists in the governments that surround Israel. Uh, but reality means that they have to live in that context. They have to exist in that context. And it's I mean, good luck with how things are going now. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.